you. I'm Cassidy Quinn, and this is Mentally Together. Because whether you can see it on the surface or not, we are all just trying to keep ourselves mentally together. And no matter what our brains are experiencing, we're not alone, we're together. Speaking of our brains, they're pretty cool and also pretty mysterious. Like personally, I know that some days my brain feels pretty great. Some days it feels pretty crappy and I don't technically know what's going on inside my brain to cause those feelings. And every day I take an SSRI to help my brain feel better. And SSRI stands for Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitor. And serotonin is often called the feel-good hormone of our brain, so it makes sense that this type of antidepressant works to create more of it. And for my brain, I think it works pretty well. But of course, I say pretty well. Like, what does that actually mean? I know that my brain feels better than when I was at my lowest three years ago before I started taking the meds, but I've also never tried any other medication or any other type of treatment besides recently starting therapy. So what if there was something out there that would actually work better? It's tough with SSRIs. If you've taken one, you know that often the first few weeks, you actually feel worse than you originally did. And you can be like, wait, why am I doing this? But a few weeks in, if it works for you, it starts to make you feel better. And then if you eventually wanna stop taking that med or switch to a new one, which I've never done, but I've heard, it is not a super fun process because you can have withdrawal symptoms, so you have to wean your body off of the old med and then start the worse feeling process over with a new one. Anyway, today we are talking about a totally different type of treatment for depression, ketamine. Now, when I say that, you might be thinking, whoa, Cassidy, what are you talking about? That is a horse tranquilizer, or whoa, that's Special K, a party drug. And technically, you're not wrong. But I remember when I was in college, my improv teacher would remind us to say yes and. So yes to those things. And also, there are now places you can go, doctors you can go see, to get a ketamine infusion for your depression. And as my guests today will get into in just a few minutes, it's a much smaller dose than if you were using it as an anesthetic or a party drug. And this is fascinating to me because I am all for anything that can be proven to help people's brains. Even if on the surface, it sounds kind of crazy. I mean, where I live in Oregon, just last year, we legalized psilocybin-assisted therapy, which is magic mushrooms, as you may know. And I have heard so many stories of that really helping people. So when I first read about using ketamine to treat depression, I was really curious and also, admittedly, a little skeptical. But I was also a little skeptical before I took my SSRIs because, yeah, it feels a little daunting to take something into our body that is going to affect our brain. But the more I learn about it, the more I'm like, yes, why not? If it can work, we should do it. And yeah, maybe there's a stigma around using certain types of drugs for our brains right now, but why? Fun or not so fun, fact, decades ago, there were studies being done on the medicinal uses of different psychedelics. But in 1970, when the Controlled Substances Act was passed, all of it stopped because LSD, psilocybin, ecstasy were all made illegal. So what would the world and our brains be like if we had allowed those studies to continue? Just like what would the world and our brains be like now if we hadn't been stigmatizing depression, anxiety, OCD, all of the mental illnesses for decades and decades. But ketamine, because of its use as an anesthetic, is legal for medicinal use. And it has been since the 1960s. Specifically, it is an FDA-approved anesthetic and is available for off-label prescription by a licensed clinician. But that's legal doctor jargon that I will let my guests today get more into. It's Dr. Stephen Mandel and Sam Mandel, the founders of Ketamine Clinics Los Angeles. Dr. Mandel has been using ketamine to treat patients for over 40 years as a board-certified anesthesiologist. He's also a founder of the American Society of Ketamine Physicians, Psychotherapists, and Practitioners. Sam Mandel is his son and also the chief operating officer at Ketamine Clinics Los Angeles. They opened the clinic together seven years ago in 2014 and since then have administered over 8,000 treatments. 
So I loved talking to them about what ketamine infusions entail, what it actually does to the brain, and how it has helped many of their patients feel so much better. So let's get into it with... They're the father and son duo of the ketamine world. It is Dr. Stephen Mandel, the doctor with the starry night hat, of course, and Sam Mandel. Welcome to the show. (laughs) Great to be here. Thank you guys so much. I'm so excited to talk to you guys. I'm so curious, and I'm sure so many of our listeners have so many questions about ketamine and the treatments you guys do in the mental health world. But before we get into all that, I just kind of want to know how you both found yourselves in the mental health world. Like, how did you get to this place? I started out in the mental health world. I was a very questioning adolescent. And then I majored in in psychology in college. And then I went to graduate school in clinical psychology. I, In fact, I was writing my dissertation after four years of coursework. I did all my exams and everything. I was completing my PhD in clinical psychology. And I had the opportunity to go to medical school. And off I went to medical school. And long story, very short, I ended up choosing (laughs) anesthesiology. Everyone said, oh, he's going to be a psychiatrist. Well, I am a psychiatrist today, although I never did a residency in psychiatry. But um, I did anesthesiology for many years, but I continued my interest in psychology and in, in, in suffering, really, um, because uh, it's a very awful kind of suffering. And when ketamine came out, I was really primed to look into it more closely, but I'm getting ahead of your question. <laughs> you did a really good job of a long story short. That's impressive. There's a lot in there. I volunteered for Teen Line when I was 13 years old, which is a teen to teen prevention hotline. And that was my first, I guess, even semi formal exposure to mental health. I didn't go on to pursue it uh, in college, but um, just from a young age, was, you know, uh, did get a little bit of training in that and in, in supporting people going through struggles with suicidal ideation and, and depression. And just had a lot of it in my world, frankly, you know, with friends, family, and, and, grew up around it and addiction. And so, you know, I, I was always personal for me and always something I paid attention to, I, I suppose. Long story short, uh, I'm an actor and I've worked in a lot of different industries and always been passionate about helping people, making a positive difference. And, you know, one of the reasons why I was drawn to uh, entertainment was to make people laugh and ease suffering and communicate and connect with people and foster meaningful conversation and when Dr. Mandel started to bring things about ketamine and depression uh, to my attention, I became very, very interested. And we started the clinic together seven years ago. That makes so much sense when you put that connection together of like, I entered the entertainment world to make people smile and laugh. And that's exactly what we're doing. I actually went to acting school. Uh, that's what I did when I was a kid. And then Went to acting school, added broadcast journalism into the mix, got more into the news world. And then Mm -hmm. thanks to my own brain, I was like, wait a minute, mental health. This is, and yeah, it's the same thing. When I was acting, it was like, I just want people to like smile and have fun. Oh, here we are doing that again. That's the goal, which is what you guys are working on doing at the Ketamine Clinics LA, right? Yeah, absolutely. We were really among the first in the world to do this. And we took... You know, they say the uh, the pioneers take the arrows and the settlers take the land. <laughs> and we see the land being taken all around us. Oh, <laughs> we're, no. we're, still re- we're still recovering from the arrows. But it was very <laughs> strange and, and, and distant out there uh, and weird. And um, there were some arrows. And now it's um, we're, we're, we're treating like the, the grand old men that, that we sort of are. And now it's only... Uh, a latency age kid at seven years. I say that the arrows are still being thrown or shot. They just have a different poison on the tips now. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> but I love that analogy. I think it's great. Yeah. Yeah. So what, for anyone that doesn't know, what exactly do you guys do at the clinic? We have fun. <laughs> we take people who, or most of whom, have tried all of the conventional means of relieving their suffering from chronic depression, from PTSD, from suicidal thoughts, from intrusive thoughts that really prevent them from having satisfying lives, from disordered eating, from substance abuse, from postpartum depression. There are a number of other things, but principally chronic depression, PTSD, and suicidality. And we relieve them of this over 80% of the time. 
Most of those people have tried all of the other things except perhaps ECT and perhaps TMS before they come to us. Increasingly, people are bypassing these things which don't work as well, which are much worse side effects and which take much longer and which do help people, but a much smaller portion of them. And we take these folks and we give them six infusions over two or three weeks, 55 minute infusions of a medication called ketamine, which was approved by the FDA in 1970, has a long and hallowed history as the best anesthetic in the world for the field and the most widely used anesthetic in the world for decades. We take this anesthetic in doses about one-tenth of what an anesthesiologist would use for anesthesia. And we give that over 55 minutes, two or three times a week for two or three weeks. And 80 plus percent of them are relieved of what brought them in. Wow. For varying periods ranging from as little as a few weeks to as much as a couple of years. At the end of which time they have a couple of boosters. Not They don't go through all six again. And it almost always restores their benefit to where it was at the end of their first series. Wow. Kind of like a flu shot. Like you go back and you refresh it and. Exactly. Yeah. There's wow. no, uh, there's no such thing as a cure. And, um, you know, we really feel it's important to make that distinction and ketamine infusion therapy is not a cure either. It's a treatment. And, um, typically as more time goes on with a healthy lifestyle and therapy and other things that are combined with, uh, the treatment, People need it less often over time. And we have had some people get one initial series of six over two to three weeks and they don't come back again. They're able to implement, you know, changes that they need, get the relief that they need and maintain. And then there are others that may need to return, you know, a month or two months later for just a pair of boosters. But they typically get more mileage out of those subsequent visits or follow-up visits over time. So advocates of... Uh, incorporating other modalities like talk therapy and and encouraging patients to get adequate sleep, nutrition, exercise. I mean, those things are so important and I I feel are often kind of underrated in the conversation. You know, I know even for myself, it doesn't take more than just a couple of nights of mediocre sleep before I notice a big difference in my mood and energy and focus. So that's... That one took me way too long to learn and I still like to tell myself it's not true, but it's definitely the case. Or like getting outside? Yeah, or getting some sunshine and fresh air. I mean, Mm -hmm. not to say that, oh, if you sleep well or you get some sun, you're going to, you're not going to be depressed anymore. But these things really make a big difference. You know, and I think we have a culture, especially in America, of this kind of grind that we glorify not taking care of ourselves in these ways. Like, ah, you don't need sleep. You should be, you know, you should be working through, you know, work while they sleep kind of thing, you know, and it can really wear wear your mental health out. Yeah, absolutely. It's so cool hearing you guys say what the process is and what the success rate. I mean, 83% that of people feel better. That's amazing. What like what with the other people, the 17%, are they it just doesn't work? Like what what happens for them? We call the the 83% is the people who complete all six and whose post measures are twice as good or half as bad as their pre measures. So if you do like, for example, a a mattress or a PHQ-9, which is a pretty standard, short form, rough assessment of your degree of depression. I just filled that out the other day. It's basically like, how many times in the past week have you felt hopeless? Exactly. Zero, Uh, one to three, Right. more than half. Right. So when we say 83% success rate, it's not something, oh, it looks successful to us. No, it's a measure. And our pre-measure... And our post-measure are the same instruments. And we use a a collection of instruments because no one is particularly good. These are blunt instruments. You took it. You know how sensitive it really is. Mm -hmm. So our post-measures are better than twice as good as our pre-measures. Or that it's not success. Now, someone who's relieved 40% is really very happy. And we're happy to help them. And they maybe in another two infusions, they will... Reduce their numbers. The numbers are really important, Cassidy. So when you speak to me and someone in your profession speaks to me, they know they're not hearing my guesstimate or my wish. They're hearing an actual measure. But real life, what mostly counts is not these tests. 
what does the patient experience? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What does the patient's child experience? What does the patient's partner experience? What does the patient's employer experience? What does the patient's golf partner or Marjan partner or stamp collecting club partner or hiker <laughs> in, 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 in a hike, what, how do these people occur? Are these people able to laugh? Do they get pleasure? Does food stop tasting like sawdust and start tasting like, oh, that's really Aww. good. When you come out and you look at the sky and you say, yeah, it's blue. You say, oh man, it's sparkly. That's, <laughs> That's much better than the PHQ-9. And something that's really interesting as well is that some people have uh, their identity very strongly tied to their condition. You know, you can spend, you know, 10, 20, 30 years depressed. It starts to become that, you you know, you're not John who who is dealing with depression. Like you are a depressed person, you know, and people think of themselves that way sometimes. So that can be a whole other challenge to help patients to overcome and separating that out. So when somebody has actually got their depression scores dropping by half or more, and then they say, well, you know, I don't know if it's really working for me. There's this delayed reaction sometimes or, or delayed acknowledgement or appreciation for how much they have improved actually. And that can take some time for people. And so it's helpful to be able to say, you know, and it's, it's a really interesting kind of phenomenon. And to be able to say, wow, well, you know, your scores are down by half. And as Dr. Mandel mentioned, of course, the number one most important thing is how does the patient feel? We want them to feel good and be enjoying life again. So it's helpful to see like, oh, well, your wife said you took her out to dinner for the first time in two years. <laughs> I mean, uh, that's pretty cool, don't you think? Yeah, yeah, I guess. Yeah, you know what? I guess that's <laughs> cool. And they say, you know, your depression scores are down a lot. That's great, right? I mean, we can at least acknowledge that. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. And it can take a little while sometimes to start to sink in this new way of being that sometimes has not been around for, you know, 10, 20, 30 years. That makes a lot of sense. Sometimes, yeah, you can't notice the the seemingly small changes because you're there every day in your brain. Yeah. And then, oh, wait, actually, it actually it does feel a lot better. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. What does it actually feel like? Like if you are the patient coming in and you're getting this infusion, I would imagine a lot of people are curious. I'm very curious. Like what does, I mean, it is, ketamine is a psychedelic, right? Yes and no. Ketamine is put together with the other psychedelics because of the effect that it has subjectively. It's a very different chemical than any of the other psychedelics. It has very similar subjective effects. It's called a disassociative as opposed to a psychedelic in formal terms. But yes, to answer your question <laughs> more directly, it's a psychedelic. Well, yes and no, because it's it's a pretty big uh, question if we want to really get into that. There's a lot of yeah. elements there as far as what the implications are, you know, of, of calling it that. I mean, be it uh, legal and the mechanism of action, how it works. I mean, so, you know, when you, when you think of psychedelics, it's like... It, a lot of people do put ketamine into the same category as LSD, like right acid or psilocybin, the active ingredient in magic mushrooms, ayahuasca. Um, and, you know, those are some of the more popular psychedelics. Obviously, there's peyote and, and, and others. But um, ketamine is, as Dr. Mendel said, it's a dissociative anesthetic. The way it works on the brain is different. It's been used in medicine for over 50 years. It's the only one that's FDA approved. There's an abundance of safety and efficacy data on ketamine that we don't have on these other substances because they've been illegal. And then there's just, I mean, we can go down the rabbit hole. There's a whole lot more there, but I want to give you time to, you know, in whatever direction you want. <laughs> no, I like the rabbit hole. Well, yeah. and a lot of people hear of ketamine either in the anesthesia world or in the like club drug party world. But as you, Dr. Mandel said earlier, you're giving a very small dose, like what someone might take if they were trying to have a crazy night is not what they're getting infused over 55 minutes, right? Really? Right. But just to go just a tiny bit down that different rabbit hole. Yeah. <laughs> we're not only giving a different quantity, but very crucially important. We're giving it by a different route of administration. Just unfortunately, whatever, serendipity, nature, providence. When you stuff powder up your nose, you get a very different experience than when you give a liquid in a vein. 
even if you adjust the quantity, the experience is entirely different. Huh. And it's because of the root of administration. And that used to be something people could argue about. But now we have a medicine that's approved for use by both roots. Two medicines that are approved for use by both roots. And wow. we can clearly demonstrate that although there are differences in the medicines, the real difference in the effect comes from the root of administration. Because you guys do it through an IV, but then there is, we're you referring to, there's yeah. like, there's a nasal spray too that is now people give nasal from spray. doctors too. People give pills, people give sublingual lozenges that look like little waxy chiclets you put under your tongue. Huh. Uh, people give suppositories, dermal patches. It's been tried by uh, pulmonary insufflation. All of the orifices have been explored. But what, what wow. Mantel, yeah, that's, I, I guess, one way of putting it. Um, I think what he was being a little bit uh, not as detailed about that you're asking about, Cassidy, is the nasal spray and uh, in particular S ketamine or Spravato. So mm. that uh, was approved by the FDA in, in March of 2019 for depression. So it's important to note that IV infusions of ketamine uh, are an off label treatment. So ketamine, the medicine, is an FDA approved medicine, but it's approved to be an anesthetic. And using it off label is totally fine and very common to use medicines off label in the US. About one in three psychiatric medications are prescribed off label. And uh, one in four of all prescription medications are prescribed to, to be used off-label. So super common. And all that means is as a physician, I have good basis to use this for something other than the demographic or the condition that it was originally approved for. And it's what's being done now with ketamine infusions for depression and other mood disorders. Super safe, super effective. Um, Spravato was approved specifically, which is essentially more or less ketamine. It's one molecule of the two molecules of ketamine was approved specifically for depression, but, but, but because it's a nasal spray, just the, that route of administration alone reduces the efficacy to about 35 to 40%. Whereas infusions in most research is about 70, 71%. And in our clinic, 83%. So these are some really interesting, now when you start really kind of peeling back the layers, there's kind of a lot going on in the, in the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. There, there are little paths and tunnels off of the rabbit hole that go into other rabbit holes. It <laughs> yeah. really is because in, in countries where the, the chemical that's approved with the brand name Stravato in the United States is one of two isomers of ketamine. Okay. Ketamine has two isomers in nature and they exist 50, 50, an R isomer, right. And an S isomer for left S is sinister is Latin for left. Spravato is the S isomer for reasons that are way beyond this program. The company that patented it was able to convince the FDA to take this generic drug that had two isomers and let them patent one of the isomers as special and put it on patent. And they, they sell it for like a hundred times what you can buy the generic for, but you know, that's what makes them able to fund the research. But in countries where, that same chemical is legal to be given intravenously. And when it's compared with the mixture, the results are almost indetectably different. I mean, it, yeah. they're the same. They're not exactly the same, but they're so close, it's, it's de minimis. It's, so it's really, we're talking now about a different, not of medicine, but of root of administration. But one thing that also you remind me of, Dr. Mandela, that I think is really important to point out is, well, why why would they do that? Why wouldn't we just have ketamine? And why isn't we don't just have ketamine approved then as IV ketamine? And why do we need to take an isomer? Well, the, the patent is up on ketamine. Uh, uh, the racemic mixture wow. is the two. It's an old medicine. It's been around for, you know, 50 years. No one can package it and sell it and profit off of the actual medicine itself. So there was uh, people- There's no markup. Yeah, no market, multiple, multiple manufacturers. It's generic. It's essentially a generic medicine. So there's no money in the actual sale of it. So that's why there was this, how can we, how can we, you know, of course, what does big pharma want to do? <laughs> yeah. Money, that's what they do. You know? So that's kind of how we got to, to that point in the, in the process, which, you know, and look, in some ways is a step forward. It helped to bring a lot more attention to ketamine, help people who maybe can't have infusion something other, an alternative, right? Other than prescription pills. And so not just not to put it down or say that it's bad or anything, 
But when you do do a side-by-side -side comparison, there are a lot of some substantial advantages to IV infusions. And it's not a matter of opinion or who's better or worse. It's just science, really, is what it comes down to. Wow. That's super interesting. Yet there are a lot of rabbit holes. One thing I'm curious about, and I don't know how much of this is known in your world, but what, like, what is actually happening to a brain getting a ketamine infusion that leads to you feeling better, your mood changing? Like what, what actually, I, and to, I mean, if you just say like, it's magic, that's fine too, but. Uh, there's no magic, <laughs> no magic. I'll let you give the kind of <laughs> So I can, I can touch maybe briefly on the experiential, but I think even though there's a lot we, we don't know, there's definitely a lot that we do know. And I think you can speak to some of that, Dr. Mandel. In a nutshell, ketamine is causing new growth in the areas of your brain that tend to shrivel up with depression. And it's causing it at, use the word magical, at rates we've never seen before. So much so we not be leaving of them when we first saw them, but they're happening, they're true. You're getting new receptors, new, greater receptor density, more dendritic connections, more elaborate arborizations of connections in the brain, but really, really fast, almost unexplainably fast, much faster than anything we know about. And we don't fully understand. I could speak for a long time about the explanation du jour and blah, blah, blah. But the nutshell is it's causing new growth in the areas of the brain associated with depression. And it's wow. very unique to ketamine. This is not a Band-Aid and this is not like any other antidepressant medication or anything else we've had available before that we're aware of. This, this actual enhanced function that's measurable is pretty remarkable. And then there's also the experiential component, which we talked a lot more about earlier, right? So just being able to quiet that noise in your head to have an objective view of yourself, your life, your problems, your past, that is really unique, that, that quieting of that chatter that we all have going on in our minds at all the time and negative self-talk. Ketamine can really quiet or even silence that during an infusion. And it's the discoveries and the meditations or uh, even sometimes the sadness or joy that can come up in those moments that can be really transformative. Sometimes people are laughing during their infusions. Sometimes they're crying. A lot of times they're silent and reflective. Sometimes they're enjoyable. Sometimes they're difficult. There's such a range of experiences and emotions that can come up during that process that are totally separately therapeutic from the scientific effects that Dr. Mandel is talking about. So the two together is powerful. Wow. And this rather loud and sometimes almost bullying voices of judgment in your head mm -hmm. become really quiet and you're able to manage them. And they're still going to tell you when you, uh, greens between your teeth, <laughs> but they're not going to tell you, you don't look as good as she does, or uh, he's got a better car than you do. All the other stuff that we use to promote our own self-deprecation, those mm -hmm. voices become manageable. Yeah, that your more your brain more focuses on like the actual facts. Like yes. there is something in my teeth. Yes. Yes. But doesn't yeah. mean I'm a stupid loser. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's the lack of <laughs> lack of a negative judgment on whatever it is. So yeah, that's a powerful thing. Wow. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. That's fascinating. Thank you guys for explaining all that <laughs> yeah have you been putting off a visit to the doctor for way too long yeah i do that too and when i finally do call and make an appointment the doctor's office usually tells me the next available appointment is months away that's why i've started going to zoom care with locations in Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and Colorado, ZoomCare offers same-day doctor visits that you can book online or from their app. Yep, you don't have to talk to anyone on the phone. They even offer mental health visits, where you can speak to a board-certified mental health provider in person or through video. ZoomCare is where I went last year for my ADHD diagnosis, and they made the process so simple. They really took away my stress. So if you're ready to make an appointment of your own, head to ZoomCare.com. That's ZoomCare, Z-O-O-M-C-A-R-E.com. Does grocery shopping stress you out? 
Do you order takeout way too often? Let me tell you about something that has really helped me combat both of those things. Instacart. With my ADHD and anxiety, sometimes the whole process of figuring out what to make for dinner, then getting the ingredients, and then actually making it seems like a lot. So now I have cut out one part of that process by shopping on Instacart. I can go online and search for exactly what ingredients I need, pick out the best deals, and then wonderful human shoppers will go out into the world and hand select everything. You can even order from multiple stores at the same time. Then it's delivered to your door in as fast as one hour. Oh, and probably my favorite part is that all of my orders are saved in Instacart. So then the next time I order groceries, I can just click and reorder my usual stuff. It's amazing. Is it weird to say that online grocery shopping has helped my mental health? Only if it wasn't true. To get free delivery on your first order over $35, click the link in the show notes. It lets Instacart know we sent you, gets you that free delivery, and helps support our show. Now, back to the show. You guys touched on talk therapy. So is there talk therapy involved when someone comes in and gets a ketamine infusion? Or is that something you guys recommend in addition to it? Or what's that process like? That, like so many other things you raised, really has a lot of nuance. So at our clinic, Ketamine Clinics Los Angeles, um, we have really emphasized giving the patient a private experience to have the infusion and see kind of what might come up for them during it uh, a little bit more independently. We're there, we're with them, we're monitoring them. We use hospital grade monitoring equipment for their vitals just to make sure that they're safe the whole time. Pulse ox, um, you know, uh, EKG, blood pressure, all that is monitored and we can see and hear them the whole time. But uh, we don't try to guide them or do any kind of talk therapy during the infusion. We do strongly encourage them to work through things that come up. And obviously after their infusion, we talk to them and how was it and they can share with us, but we don't try to do therapy at that time. We encourage them to journal and to talk with their other treating provider, which they usually have to process things that might've come up. And the infusion itself is a time when a, a lot of things do come up that you might not even have intended to work on or even known might have been as important to you as you might've realized. So it's an opportunity really uh, for discovery in a lot of ways. It can be. Ketamine is uh, very, very effective in relieving the suffering we've been talking about. Recently, there's been a movement for what's called CAP, K-A-P, Ketamine-Assisted Psychotherapy, which involves giving ketamine uh, either low-dose intramuscularly or via a lozenge sublingually. The reason it has to be low-dose is they combine the dissociative experience with doing therapy simultaneously. There are pluses and minuses of that. I am very, very enthusiastic about all of the non-predatory attempts to see where you can go in helping people with this medicine. Mm -hmm. Uh, Similarly, there's KEP, K-E-P, Ketamine Enhanced Psychotherapy, where ketamine is given by the therapist, but not during sessions, but in, in between, but in temporal coordination with the session. Hmm. Now, these are really great explorations, and I'm very enthused about them. But there is a whole clot of CAP people who are basically saying, if you're just, and I quote the just, giving ketamine, you're not being responsible, or you're not doing it right, or you're in it for the wrong reasons. If you really cared, you'd be doing CAP. In fact, we're getting an 83% success rate without doing any therapy. If anyone can show me any way of enhancing that, I will adopt it immediately when I have evidence. But their strong opinion or their thrall about how good it feels to do is not evidence. Well, I think some of the things that are important to cover with this is that, you know, it's not a one size fits all. And there are definitely people who may have blocks and challenges with getting uh, through certain things that are difficult to cover in their therapy that using ketamine, whether it's, you know, CAP, which is a pretty specific structure of integrating ketamine with the therapy or CAP, which is maybe a little less formal, 
that might be the perfect thing for that person to get right, right past that obstacle in their, in their treatment. There are a lot of people who that isn't necessarily indicated for. I think, frankly, most people could probably benefit from both at different times. But the issue is the amount of time and energy and relationship and building that are required to really appropriately do cap or cap can be prohibitive, cost and time prohibitive. We're very strong advocates for talking therapy. Talking therapy is very important. Ketamine is a treatment, not a cure. One of the great enhancers and extenders of it is talking therapy. There are lots of kinds of talking therapy. Therapy is a process that requires time. No matter how good your ability to develop rapport, no matter how quickly the chemistry between you and your therapist develops, and the chemistry is super important. Formulaic therapy doesn't work well. It's an intimate, individualized process. Whether that takes place in the same room as an infusion, or in a room next door, or in a room down the street, or the previous day or the next day, whether that makes any difference in the ability of that person to manage their suffering, there's no data on that. But having already achieved 83% with this standalone, but it isn't a standalone because we advocate strongly for talking therapy, just not under our roof. And we think it's tremendously advantageous to have a relationship with a therapist that way preceded your ketamine infusions, and that you can go to sleep at night comfortable that that relationship is going to continue after your immediate treatment from our clinic is over. Most people are already working with a, a therapist when they come to us, and we do also provide a virtual support groups online that are led by a licensed therapist, not instead of, but in addition to, uh, with some free sessions just to help to integrate in an opportunity for patients to speak with other patients about what they're going through and what their experiences have been in a safe space led by a licensed therapist. And it's specifically a support group. It's not therapy or group therapy. Um, and that's something that we feel has been helpful for people. Uh, so, yeah. Well, and Sam, because you mentioned earlier that sometimes when people come in for an infusion, some past trauma or something that the patient might not even know that that was bothering them deep right. in the depths of their brain. So then when that comes up, like what, what happens? Do they, right. are they working through it while they're getting the infusion or do you come out and you have a new thought process around it? It's more like a gift that they can, that they receive, that they can go take and unbox with someone, unpack it. Mm. Up. let's let's explore that you know and and to call a past trauma a gift maybe sounds a little provocative in a way but it is because some of these things can be so debilitating to people and sometimes they literally don't even know what they are well, so it's not the it's not the trauma that's the gift it's it's the insight the awareness the being able to look at full in the face without cowering Right. Because it already happened, but you blocked right. it that's, out. That's just, and that's yeah, just it. that's and so that's exactly what the, the gift is. That moment of that knowledge is power, that realization, that ability to identify what is at the source of your pain in so many ways. And some people really do have, you know, and it's hard for some people listening who maybe don't have this experience or haven't, you know, unveiled something, but have trauma that's so deeply repressed. They're really quite literally not even aware of it. Um, and then other times there's something that you might remember or be aware of, of course, but be very disconnected from just how much it's actually impacted you or is still impacting your life. And these kinds of things, when they're discovered, can absolutely be priceless and essential to work through. They just don't have to be worked through the moment you have that uh, realization. Ooh, OK, that makes sense. Cassidy, you, 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 in, your, in your speaking, you said, well, because it already happened. And you're right, and it, that got stored away. And that's kind of in stone. What happened, happened. We're never going to change that. But packed away with that is often a narrative, which is malleable, which is changeable, which is something that didn't happen, but that you created around the events that did happen. And that narrative, outside of your awareness, can really be guiding your life in very adverse ways. And if as uh, Sam points out, the gift you get is the ability to re-examine, potentially rework 
the narrative around what happened in a way which leads to a much freer, more open existence. If you're going through life basically steering by what you're seeing in the rearview mirror, your driving isn't so good. When you can stop looking in that rearview mirror and start looking forward through the windshield, you drive much better. Yeah, that's a good metaphor. That makes a lot of sense. Well, in thinking about therapy, what you both said about therapy can take a long time. It, it, it's supposed to be a long process. It's not like you go to one therapy appointment and, oh my gosh, we talked through everything and now it's all great. I have my second therapy appointment ever tomorrow. So I am new uh, to the therapy, the oh, actual cool. therapy world, but yeah. I have spent hours and hours and hours like calling therapists, looking up therapists, like that whole process. So I totally get how it can take forever. And then once you're in the session, maybe there's something in my life from my childhood or whatever that I'm not going to bring up to the therapist because right. I don't know that it's there to bring up to the therapist. And right. sometimes that bugs me that I'm like, I feel like half of my life, I don't even remember. And I think it was pretty great, but like, maybe <laughs> there's something down in my brain. I have no idea. So it, it makes sense to me that having something to help bring them back, bring it up. Well, we, we live in a world of, you know, instant gratification and we all want it now. And, you know, it takes time. And I think it's great that you were, able to do that research to try to find the right person because that match is so important and it takes time of showing up and, and, and sharing for those things to get uncovered. And, uh, it isn't necessarily the pressure on you to come up with the, you know, the thing and <laughs> your therapist either, and you guys work together and over time you start to make progress. You know, I know that sometimes people have a feeling of like, I just want, give me the epiphany moment now. Can I just have some <laughs> and get out of here you know and it's like the what no I never think that no never. yeah <laughs> yeah like I, I'm pretty sure I said one, something very similar to my therapist of like I just think there's gonna be some like answer and so I google and right. then there's not an answer like there's right. not these are not just right. fixes yeah well, can you just fix me? might not even notice it you know it's a little like saying you know I've really worked out hard and I'm very strong now I'm gonna lift myself up by my shoelaces it isn't going to happen. It isn't because I didn't work out hard enough. You're not standing in the right place. That's why therapists are therapists. None yeah. of us have eyes in the back of our heads. You're therapists, and it's really good that you did the due diligence of identifying someone who you can resonate with and who you feel you can trust. Because mm -hmm. you've got to really relax into it and go for it and rely upon his or her ears or their ears to guide you to what you're not noticing, to the elephant in the room that is unseen. That's one of the things that ketamine can facilitate. It makes the unseen seen. So does therapy. So does meditation. So do many other things. But ketamine does it quickly and reliably and at low risk. It also really gives people the relief to be able to start to do those things, right? So for so many people, when you're really depressed, it's you, you, it really impairs your functioning. I mean, it's hard to, to go online and look at reviews or call people or make appointments or try to see who's a good match. And when someone's really depressed, that that's just not really possible a lot of the time. And ketamine can really relieve the suffering and give people energy and motivation and, and leave them feeling good again so that they can go and take those steps and get into making progress longer term. Wow. Yeah. Dr. Mandel, you said low risk. So I'm sure there's people listening that are thinking, okay, what there, there's gotta be a risk. Like it can't just be this 83% success rate. Everything's great. Are, are there risks? Are there downsides to it? There are downsides compared to the alternatives. In my opinion, they're negligible, but yes, there are downsides. You're going to spend money. Mm. You're going to spend time. You're going to get up hope. And you're already having a really hard time getting up open life. You're going to get invested in this and say, oh, oh, this is going to help me. And it might not. And that's painful. So there are risks like that. Actual, the risk of the medicine, 5 to 10% get nauseated. It lasts less than an hour. We can give medicine to take it away. 5 to 10% get a headache. And it's usually mild and it's uh, NSAIDs will relieve it. And it's hydration and time, take it away within an hour and a half, two hours, over 99% of the time. 
There are many things that detractors will tell you ketamine can cause. Ketamine given therapeutically by a caregiver in a clinic does not cause any of those things. I can give you a whole long list. We could do a program on it. It's just used to scare people. It has nothing to do with ketamine therapeutically. It's going to hurt your bladder. It's going to cause cognitive impairment. Your liver's going to fall out. You'll have funny oh. things grow in your brain. We can do all of those things with massive doses, almost lethal doses to animals and laboratories. They don't happen to humans. Some of them happen to humans who use ketamine in super anesthetic doses daily for years. Okay? They do get something called ketamine bladder. Hmm. And it is a problem about... It's hard to tell how many people are doing this because they don't come forward because they'd be arrested if they did. Mm -hmm. But about it seems like somewhere between around 15 plus percent of those people after about five years of daily use of a gram or more get ketamine bladder. It was a rough statistics. As I say, people don't come forward volunteer for these studies. Yeah. They have nothing to do with ketamine as a treatment for depression. Also, because some people do use ketamine recreationally, um, special K, or, or they use it to self-medicate, which I think is an important distinction. It's something that some people have concern about potentially uh, is it going to be addictive. Am I going to get addicted to it? Well, ketamine is not physically addictive. It's not like an opioid or like alcohol or nicotine. We can actually become physically dependent upon it. It just doesn't work that way. So while some people may use it to escape, uh, it's no different than than them using any, anything else of their choosing to try to escape from whatever it is they're trying to escape. Yeah, that's those are definitely good good distinctions. Thank you. That makes sense. What about so treatment resistant depression is something mm-hmm. I've heard when I've been looking up why people would what would lead people to go seek ketamine treatment mm-hmm. for their depression and that as far as I know is. You maybe you've tried a bunch of antidepressants or SSRIs as they're called. I am on one. It seems to have worked mostly well for my brain, but sometimes they either don't work. You're on the wrong one. You try a different one or you try one and it works for you for decades and then it stops working. It, is that one big way that people come to you guys? When people use the word treatment resistant depression, it really comes from research where people are contemplating higher level more expensive and more risky treatments. And so, and insurers say, you have to demonstrate that the patient has is treatment resistant. I kind of, I don't like the language because it puts the onus on the patient. The patient's resistant. The patient is resistant. The treatments yeah. haven't worked. But anyway, uh, depending on who you read, uh, you have to try a, a, a adequate, meaning enough dose and enough time of two or three different antidepressants and have failed at them, that's their word, in order to be eligible to escalate your level of care. And in the middays of ketamine, not the early days and not the later days, which are just emerging, <laughs> you had to be treatment resistant for a establishment psychiatrist to advocate or to okay, you're going on to ketamine. You had mm. to fail it. And the original study, the original really good gold standard study by Zarati at the National Institute of Mental Health in, in 2006 used TRD, treatment resistant depression. And it's a term of art, TRD, treatment resistant depression. Because those are the only people you would dare to use this experimental drug. And it may be in 2006, you could justify that kind of language. And this was a really pioneering study. But the, one of the major points in Zarati's study, and by the way, 71% of his treatment resistant patients, by treatment resistant, we mean people who had not benefited from all prior interventions. 71% of them were relieved of their depression. Wow. Yeah, actually, a yeah. lot of the um, studies done have included a treatment resistant patients. So uh, that's one of the things that was so profound about ketamine and, and still is in its discovery and its development is 
uh, that it's not just, quote, just working for, you know, people who are depressed, which is obviously a big deal, but people who are depressed have not benefited from anything else. So it works when nothing else has, which is really huge. And there are a lot of studies proving the safety and efficacy of ketamine specifically for mood disorders. So even though that is an off-label use and there's no shortage of research, there's about 150 independent clinical trials that have been conducted proving ketamine works for, for depression and other mood disorders. And I'm talking to leading institutions like Yale, Stanford, USC, UCLA, National Institute of Mental Health. I mean, the Cleveland Clinic. Johns Hopkins, the list goes on and on and on because, you know, uh, you know, I really want to underline that because another thing that the detractors say is some of the things that Dr. Minot was touching on is they say, yeah, that's nice that it worked for so-and-so, but that's anecdotal or we need more research or it looks like maybe it has some potential, but we don't know. It's too early to tell. And that, that's just BS. You know, it's been 20 years now. We've been doing it for seven, but there's research going back 20 years. And really, if you want to look for some of the really far back stuff, there's, there's even more older than that. But there's really been a tidal wave of it in the last 20 years. I mean, 150 studies, and they are all showing that it's safe and effective. So at this point, it's it's just a it's a terrible disservice to to patients and really to to the world to be continuing to say that type of stuff. You're either not educated or you have an ulterior motive to put down ketamine, and either way, it's dangerous. Depression is the leading cause of disability in the United States. It's the leading cause in the world. I mean, it's we really need to make more effective solutions, more available to people immediately. And this is a huge one. Stop well, throwing well, arrows well, at you guys. <laughs> that, thank you. That would be a good start. <laughs> more than not throwing arrows, please try what we're advocating. If it works for you and your patients, switch over. Do it. You'll be glad and they'll be glad. Because one of the points I think got lost in all my words about treatment resistant depression is in the old days when this was kind of new, you did want to try all the more accepted treatments before you tried this. Just because that's the prudent approach to, to, to treating illness. That's not the case. You don't have to be, quote, treatment resistant, meaning you've tried everything else first. You don't have, this does not have to be the last on the list before ECT. You can come, if you're depressed, you deserve a trial of ketamine. And ECT is like electric? Electroconvulsive therapy. You're actually put into, by zapping your brain with electricity in a controlled fashion, you're put into a seizure that renders your brain electrically silent or a brief period. That's what electric convulsive therapy is. You have to have a general anesthetic to do that because along the way, it causes tremendous contractions of all your skeletal muscles. So you'd actually break bones if you were not first given a relaxant. So it's a long complicated, you don't want to go there. The point is, ketamine used to be considered one step ahead of that, and by many people, not even ahead of it. But that's not, if it had any reasonableness once upon a time, it no longer does. Yeah, and I talk to people, you know, sometimes uh, who wonder if they're bad enough yet, if they've tried enough yet. Yeah. Or is ketamine really just for somebody who's really suicidal? Well, you know, if I didn't wake up tomorrow, I'd be okay with that. But I don't really, I'm not really, really suicidal. So I guess that's, you know, I'm not bad enough. And that really pains me because it just is like, how much more suffering do you need to go through before trying something that we know has an incredibly chance, one of the best, if not the best chances of relieving that suffering? Uh, at what point is enough enough? And a lot of the language around ketamine early on was, as Dr. Mendel was saying, like last resort, experimental, try everything under the sun first. And that is definitely no longer the case today. And it's, it's great that it is moving up in the, in the kind of treatment plan, moving up the list. And, you know, frankly, I personally think it should be one of the first things that's tried now, um, which it's not quite there yet, but it's moving in that direction because as you mentioned, SSRIs and prescription medications, which definitely can help some people and there's absolutely nothing wrong with them. They can take weeks to months to work. They can require adjusting of doses or combining with other meds. 
They do have negative side effects like loss of libido, weight gain, dry mouth, blurred vision, even suicidal thoughts, among others. So there are a lot of risks and, and complications with them. And for some people, they're great. And that's great. A lot of people, a substantial number of people, they either don't work or they work a little bit, but not very well. And or they then stop working. And so uh, people are constantly trying, cycling from one to the next and so on. So you don't have any of those potential issues with ketamine infusions. One of the things people might ask is, okay, so, but my doctor says my SSRIs will be mostly covered by my insurance. Right. Is ketamine also moving up in, in the insurance world too? It is actually nowhere near so quickly as we wish it would. But uh, ketamine for mood disorders is covered by the blues in Massachusetts. Yeah, I think it's Blue Cross. I think just for people who may not know what you mean when you say the blues, it's... Ah. <laughs> and other insurers are moving in that direction. But even the oh. blues in Massachusetts, in order to qualify for ketamine infusions, you have to be a failure at three oral meds. First. Three? Yes. And yeah, and you know, this is one of the things, it's like a little bit of a double-edged sword, you know, like on one hand, it's progress. We're starting to see coverage emerge, which is wonderful. On the other hand, they want you to have so much red tape to go through and so much criteria to meet. And we don't know what they're reimbursing, if it's a rate that's really sustainable for someone to provide good quality care, you know, and it, it, there's a lot of complications that come with that too, but it is absolutely progress. Um, we do give statements to our patients to file with their insurance for reimbursement after treatment. So we're at a network. We don't take insurance. We can give the, the statements with all that information. And some people get some money back, but it's usually a small amount. But yeah, that's changing. Over time, it's getting better. I think a lot of insurers are realizing that actually paying for ketamine would save them money because that really is the, the driving factor in their decisions. It's not what's best for patients, what's going to make the world a better place. <laughs> the most yeah. people, it's what's going to make money. And the truth is right. a lot of money on a lot of treatments and things that are actually not effective and that are actually much more expensive. So when they run, run those numbers, which I think they're finally starting to do a little bit, they're just starting to see like maybe, you know, six infusions in a year and then two or four every year thereafter is actually uh, good for business, not just good for people and human suffering. <laughs> Go figure that those things might actually align. That's how you convince them. You got to make it good for business. Yeah. Well, but that, that's, that's the business they're in. The blues have been reluctant to relieve the blues. Oh, <laughs> they're in the business of gathering the green. Says the guy in the blue outfit. <laughs> oh, God. We can talk about pricing if you want. Ketamine is compared to other labor intensive interventions. It's affordable. You know, if you have enough money in your pocket, it's a bargain. If you don't, it's prohibitive. But it's, it really bothers me that so many of our patients have high quality PPO insurance, for which they pay a lot of money every month. And when other prescribers prescribe something off-label, the insurance company pays for it. And when we prescribe this off-label, the insurance company says we're not paying. Yeah. And that doesn't seem right to me. Yeah. I mean, just to not be, you know, circle around it and to go, you know, those who are listening, like, okay, well, what's the price? So in our clinic, and it's different everywhere you go, but in our clinic, it's $3,900 for a series of six infusions. And that breaks down to $750 a piece for the first two, and then $600 each for all of the uh, infusions thereafter. So hmm. and then for any boosters or follow-up treatment, it's $600 for one infusion. It's a lot of money, but I, I, we see people go and get fillers every, every month <laughs> for more. And I tell yeah. you what, this will make you feel better than fellas. Yeah, I think, <laughs> you know, when you also look at some of the, you know, what people are spending on things that are not working for them, uh, it isn't really that much of a difference. If you see a psychiatrist for, you know, several hundred dollars each month or more frequently than once a month, and you're paying maybe several hundred for prescriptions, and maybe you're paying several hundred for, you know, therapy or for something else. I mean, it really, mm -hmm. and, you know, four grand in the course of a year or, you know, maybe with a pair of boosters, it comes to closer to five grand in the course of a year to be really feeling good and getting a better quality relief. Well, I absolutely recognize, and I should say we recognize it's not pocket change for a lot of people. It's not an uh, extraordinary amount of money either. And then, of course, there's the opportunity cost that I always like to point out is for somebody who's bedridden 
or who's just going through the motions of living, uh, who's not able to connect with the husband, wife, or their kids, their parents, friends, who's really just suffering through their existence. I mean, what is, how do you even put a price on that? So I, I think that where there's, you know, well, there's a way and we want to support people however we can to try something that is going to work for them or has at least a very good chance of working for them. Or with the opportunity costs, I would also think like people that feel so horrible that you can't go to work, like you cannot make any money because you are feeling so miserable. And so spend some yeah. money so then you can actually have your, your life and your career back. And We had yeah. a guy who's a great, uh, was, was really, really a good pianist. But the last time he played was on uh, one of the original late night shows. And his wife came in. And she really benefited enormously. And she gifted him infusions for his birthday. Well, he he took with great trepidation. (laughs) And uh, he's back working late night now. He's playing the piano. And I got to tell you, in one week, he's made all that this cost him and cost her. And he's got change. So, you know. (laughs) <laughs> opportunity wow. costs really count yeah oh my gosh yeah and I mean I always think of lost the one patient who told us they literally had been wanting to raise for years and got got up the courage and the confidence and the faith in their own in, their, in themselves to ask for it and got it so it's it's not always as extreme as being bedridden and going back to work or not working in years working there's a lot of gray area there too with people even getting raises and, and, and we're generating more if they're in a commission-based business or whatever, you know, there's a lot of opportunity to really um, see a lot more abundance for yourself than even looks like it's possible when you're in the throes of being, you know, so depressed. Yeah. If you're loving this episode of Mentally Together, you might be curious, what goes on behind the scenes? Which parts of the conversation were left on the cutting room floor? Well, let's talk about it over on Patreon. My patrons get to see deleted video clips from every episode and get to be the first to ask questions of each podcast guest. Like from this episode. Honestly, this extra clip is mostly just to embarrass myself because mid-interview with these very smart gentlemen, we had some technical difficulties. So that moment is over on Patreon. You can read all about the different tiers and sign up at patreon.com slash Cassidy Quinn. Again, that's Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Cassidy Quinn. Okay, now it is time for the speed round. This feels very embarrassing talking to, you know, like a doctor and you you guys that have just given me all this science knowledge, just feel, but it's great. So, okay, are you ready? <laughs> yeah, and don't be embarrassed, we're humans too. <laughs> what? Most, most of us are really quite humans. <laughs> At least well, used most of the time, yeah, yeah. When was the last time you cried? Last time I cried was when I had an interview about ketamine, and one of the interviewees was Sam, and another was a patient who really has come out because this really gave her her life back. And I have, a, I'm very affected by my patient's success. It's one of the reasons I continue to do this. I love it. Uh, But this particular woman was extraordinarily articulate and she, she had all the bases, her relationship with her child. (laughs) But she was just amazing. She was so articulate and she had all the bases, her husband, her employment, her sense of herself, her ability to modulate her own eating, her relationships with her family, her ability to reach out to her community her comfort in her in dealing with the stigma of having the affliction of depression. Uh, she hit it all. I probably oh let me change that, but that's when I last cried. That's great. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. Last time uh, I cried was probably maybe a month ago or not even, not even a month ago, actually, I guess a little bit. I had a family, someone very close to me who was actually in the hospital. And that was difficult for me. Yeah. What about the opposite? The last time you had a big belly laugh? I had a couple today. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I'm really easy that way, you know. <laughs> Life is, is is full of opportunities to go far, to let the let the giggles out, and I'm a uh, giggler. <laughs> yeah. I like it. Around. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> what is the best thing you do for your mental health? Take care of patients. Oh. <laughs> I, I, I have therapy, I meditate, uh, I walk. I believe very strongly in spending time in nature uh, without mechanical devices or noise. I eat plant-based food, which I really Ooh. think has something to do with my mental health. And I eat less than I feel like eating. Uh, I, I, I'm not joking. Don't it's, tell me that. <laughs> the great old Egyptian physician saying, a third of the food you eat benefits you. And the other two thirds benefit your doctor. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> I, everything that uh, Dr. Minnow said, I agree with. I mean, I, I love to be in nature. I like to hike, you know, we're very fortunate. I, Living here in Los Angeles, there's no shortage of beautiful places to go hiking. I love to work out, I love to lift weights. For me, you know, working out, exercise is as much or more for my mental health as it is for my physical health. And I notice a huge difference in my energy, my focus, my mood uh, when I'm working out versus not. And it changes very fast. It doesn't take more than a couple of days of being consistent to notice a big improvement. And it doesn't take more than a couple of days of not doing it to notice a decline. So I think, you know, for me at least, it's really important to consistently um, exercise. And, you know, it doesn't have to be weights, right? Whatever it might be for someone else, it is just to move. Get your heart rate up, sweat, 20 minutes or more. That's, that's pretty much the gist of it. Yeah. What is your favorite thing about your brain? Oh boy. My favorite <laughs> thing about my brain is that it's plastic. Ooh. If I really focus and work hard and get all my resources together, I can still get it to grow. Damn slowly, but I can get it. <laughs> That's so cool. I think one of the, my favorite things about my brain is that I have a very good blend of right and left brain. I can think very logically, analytically, business-minded, and also uh, very creative. I have a very, very strong creative side. And I feel like in a way that normally it's kind of, you, you often see one or the other. I think I have a pretty good blend. So I, Yeah. What's something you're really good at that people might not know? I'm a good skier. Ooh, yeah. I really like to get out in, in steep, deep powder and just yes. let them go. It's a real peak experience. Awesome. I would say that I rap and freestyle, actually. Yes. Oh, sweet. Yeah. This yeah. is the time of the show where we ask you to, no, just kidding. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I don't know if I'm going to go there right now. It really is awesome. You can do a separate show. The last one is if you had to get something tattooed on your forehead. So like we're in some weird world in the future where in the future all it's a great world because ketamine is all covered by insurance and everyone accepts it. There's no stigma, but also everyone for some reason is now getting a forehead tattoo that is like your message to the world, but also your message, you know, when you look in the mirror every day, what would your forehead tattoo say? Don't stop till Nirvana. Ooh. Mine would probably say just breathe. I think it would. It would, it would help everyone out to do that a little more. Yeah. Where can people follow you guys, you both, Ketamine Clinics LA, all the things you guys do? Yeah. Our social media is Ketamine Clinics LA. We're on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and our website has a lot of really great information, uh, ketamineclinics.com. We offer free consultations, no obligation. People can see if it's something that might be a good fit. And then is there anything else that you wanted to say that I didn't ask you about that you wish people would know? Get treatment if you're suffering. If you don't get treatment from us, get treatment from someone else. Pick someone good. It's a whole other show as to who's good. But don't go with the cheapest or the closest. Go with the best. You're not going to do this a dozen times and pick your favorite. You're going to do this once. Do it right. Amen to that. You don't need to wait anymore. Life's short. Do, do whatever you got to do to really get the most out of it and enjoy it. That's beautiful. Thank you both so much for spending so much time talking to me about so much of this, diving down so many rabbit holes. I could ask you 500 more things because this is just fascinating and I'm so hopeful that more people can get this treatment and just feel better. That's the point. That's the goal. So yeah. thank you. Yeah, thank you so much thank for you. having us. You really got me thinking about stuff. You know, it's, it's really great to have good questions. Thanks. Thank you. And thank you, wonderful human, for listening to this episode of Mentally Together. We release new episodes every Monday. So I, Cassidy Quinn, will see you next week. 
In the meantime, go do something nice for your brain today. Get outside, go lift some weights, go skiing. I mean, I guess it's not really the time of year for that. It is the middle of the summer. However, I just went on a little ski tour the other day, so you could if that is what will make your day a little bit better. <laughs> because remember, we are all just trying to keep ourselves mentally together. Together is produced, hosted, and edited by Cassidy Quinn in collaboration with Coba FM, a podcast network that is all about community, baby.